District of Conservation is sponsored by CFACT. To learn more about our sponsor, head over to CFACT.org. Thank you so much for listening to the show. Welcome to District of Conservation. I'm your host, Gabriella Hoffman. This podcast offers a sober examination into all things hunting, fishing, shooting sports, energy, environment, and the public policy surrounding it. And this podcast also specializes in original interviews that you won't hear elsewhere. Here's what I have for you today. The attacks on Pittman Robertson continue to persist. Recently, a New York Times op-ed came out, ironically, in support of the Return Act, the Republican bill that we've been criticizing here on the podcast, but in the opposite, calling for further decoupling of firearms and ammunition excise taxes that go back to Pittman Robertson funds because those items are dangerous in their minds. More similarly... A letter from the Center for Biological Diversity, a serial litigant and foe to conservation, is requesting that the Department of Interior and Fish and Wildlife Service make Idaho and Montana ineligible for Pittman-Robertson funding due to what they claim as excessive wolf killing. I will read for you both of those items. Travis Thompson, a friend of the show, one of Florida's best conservationists, recently warned about this, same with Robbie Kroger from Blood Origins, that the implications from measures like the Return Act could go downstream and impact conservation funding, where it could encourage and embolden anti-hunters and anti-gunners like CBD and other interests out there, New York Times as well. And now we see the attacks on Pittman Robertson ramp up. If you need a refresher on the Return Act and this bill from Congressman Andrew Clyde, comb through back a couple episodes to get a refresher on it or to learn about it if it's entirely new for you and you've just learned about it from my mention of it or from seeing it on social media from the two aforementioned gentlemen that I referenced in the beginning of the show. I want to read for you the New York Times article in question. And if you do not have a New York Times subscription, I don't recommend subscribing to them. Most of their writings, unfortunately, would make you very disappointed, but occasionally they have some interesting stuff, even bad stuff that is important to read. So going off of the Return Act, as I mentioned, they have an article dated August 26th, 2022, called The Sale of Product Responsible for Bloodshed and Fear is Still Tied to Our Wildlife. They are directly calling out Pittman-Robertson funding, which has been the lifeline for conservation putting back over $15 billion since 1937. Last year alone, $1.5 billion went back to the states for wildlife conservation efforts, habitat restoration, hunter's education, and similar conservation measures. It's a critical funding source. And if you were to disrupt the mechanism in place, the collection of excise taxes to go back to Department of Interior to later be distributed to the states, apportioned to general interest and usage in the states, Every state doesn't get the same amount of money. Some states get more. Some get substantially less. But in the essence of this article, the tax is now facing a challenge, with several dozen Republicans in Congress pushing legislation that would eliminate it as an infringement on the Second Amendment. Eliminating it would be a good thing, but not for the benighted reasons that inspire conservative ideologues obsessed with gun rights. And here's their reasoning. Should the sale of a product that today is responsible for so much bloodshed, mayhem, fear, and social division be tied to the financing of conservation? They also add that these ethical concerns were posed recently by two academics, one from Texas A&M and the other from Ohio State University, in the Journal of Conservation and Society. They noted that the Pittman-Robertson tax has become, quote, ever more bound up with the politics and production of guns which is itself embedded in broader patterns of social violence, end quote. If you have a curiosity to read the full article, I will link to it. But look at what the Return Act has inspired here. And if we give preservationists further involvement in conservation, let's say they are ultimately successful in decoupling firearms and ammunition excise taxes from conservation funding, or they get rid of hunting and fishing in the most extreme sense, or they severely deplete your ability to go fishing and hunting with different attacks on hunting and fishing access, which is what we're largely seeing under this administration bit by bit. We are seeing a loss of access, no adherence to safeguarding against no net loss. We see preservationists like the Center for Biological Diversity, which is one of the most problematic groups, one of the most dangerous groups, you could argue, 
that is having and wielding too much influence. They are able to convince recently with CBD versus Fish and Wildlife Service a case where they forced the Fish and Wildlife Service to settle in a lawsuit to ban lead tackle and bullets on future openings potentially on Fish and Wildlife Service lands, National Wildlife Refuges in the future. They forced them to put out a rules change to ban future openings. And who knows, maybe they'll say like, oh, we're not satisfied here enough. So let's continue with maybe retroactively banning lead ammo and tackle on Fish and Wildlife Service lands. But now if groups like CBD are to become more influential and succeed going off of this article, this cue, we now have the second item I want to talk about today, the petition requesting that the Department of Interior and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service deem Idaho and Montana ineligible for Pittman-Robertson Act funding due to what they call excessive wolf killing. And I will talk actually about how Montana wolf numbers have actually not changed since a management system has gone in place most recently. Last year's numbers show that actually the wolf population was pretty consistent. But in this letter, which I will also attach in show notes, pursue it to the Administrative Procedure Act, U.S. Code 553E, we hereby petition the Department of Interior by and through the Fish and Wildlife Service for issuance of a rule prohibiting distribution of Pittman-Robertson Act funds to the states of Idaho and Montana until their wildlife management plans fulfill the act's conservation purpose. Wolf management is a part of that conservation purpose, whether you like it or not. Congress has authorized the Secretary of Interior to distribute PR funds to states to support conservation and outdoor recreation initiatives and to prohibit the distribution of such funds if a state, quote, passes legislation contrary to the acts, end quote. DOI and FWS should disqualify Montana and Idaho from such conservation funds because they have passed legislation creating anti-predator wildlife management programs aimed at drastically reducing their ideological important wolf populations. Petitioners value wolves and work to oppose anti-predator policies and we thus qualify as interested persons under the APA. No, they don't because they abuse, sue, and settle. In EAJA, the law that, rather, it invites these serial litigants in litigious suits that are often abused by environmental organizations, radical preservationists like the CBD. For the reasons set forth in this petition, and as a matter of law, we ask DOI and FWS promptly respond to this petition and determine whether Idaho and Montana, based on their new laws aimed at decimating their wolf population, should now be ineligible for PRA funding. And who are the people behind this? In addition to Center for Biological Diversity, you have... Humane Society Legislative Fund, Humane Society of the United States. You guys probably are aware of Humane Society, and maybe some of you have adopted animals from their shelters. And if you support hunting, you need to maybe reassess your support of the HSUS because they are interfering with this. We have uh, Project Coyote, which is also very problematic. When I was in Montana recently, I saw signs from Trap Free Montana, Washington Wildlife First, another preservationist group you all need to be aware of. That is starting to emerge. There's also another group that I was recently made aware of as well. We're going to talk more about them soon. But you can see the whole list of organizations in support of this petition. And when you have people attack Pittman Robertson, even if they sound well-intentioned, you invite this type of stuff to interfere with wildlife management. Wildlife management that is tested based in science And that is sound and that contributes to conservation funding, even including the so-called controversial wolf management hunts. Now, let's talk about the decimation of wolves in Montana, if this is accurate. And I was alluding to earlier that according to Montana's Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, the wolf population remained stable in Montana during 2021. And this was dated August 1st. The wolf population only decreased by 40 individuals in 2021, according to the Fish, Wildlife, and Parks report. The report showed the estimated wolf population in Montana at the end of 2021 was 1,141 individuals, down from 1,181 in 2020. However, in the last 10 years, wolf population saw an estimated high of 1,256 individuals in 2011 and a low of 1,113 in 2017, which FPW indicates a population trend that is, quote, very stable. So why would the state wildlife agency, which receives Pittman-Robertson funds, make a determination that the wolf population is healthy if the CBD is claiming that they're violating, that the state of Montana is violating 
the conditions laid out in Pittman Robertson funds when they have the seal of approval to do this and the wolf population has shown to not be decimated. That is not grounds for removing PR funds. That's an illusory correlation. And we're going to see more groups, unfortunately, use this type of excuse claiming that wolf trapping or wolf hunting is cruel and unusual when in fact, when it's a highly regulated hunt, you may not like me hearing this, but I've talked to many people. I trust the scientists behind this, that when there's a highly regulated hunt, wolf populations don't decline as much. And if you don't know this, wolves actually reproduce pretty frequently. They have a high litter rate. They have high survivability. They can reproduce pretty quickly. And when you don't account for that, you're being dishonest about the wolf status as well. So we have, obviously, the wolf populations are fairly stable. The Manitoulin is not decimating the population as CBD is claiming. Therefore, Montana and also Idaho don't need to have their PR funds withdrawn. So you guys see the connection I'm making here about why PR funds should be maintained, why the system that is currently in place should continue to be adhered to, even if you think your gun rights are being infringed. They're not being infringed with Pittman-Robertson funds because most people, if you talk to the gun industry, like PR funds. They see the value in it. They see that it's an accountability measure, that your rights are not being infringed. Under PR funds, you have the opportunity to access public ranges. That's where your dollars are going to as well. And the Tax Foundation and other nonpartisan sources say this is one of the best executed excise taxes. Does that mean excise taxes cannot be weaponized? Absolutely. You see the proposal from my congressman, Don Beyer, to impose a 1,000% excise tax on so-called assault rifles, which are AR-15s, and they're not assault by nature, as you all very well know. That is a problematic thing. But the excise taxes we currently have in place are not problematic. They're widely popular, and they continue to pump back historic levels of funding to conservation. And more and more people are starting to fish and hunt. Interestingly enough, the pandemic gave these two activities, these two pastimes in America, a lifeline. And without this critical funding, conservation will be lost altogether. So you see, I went full circle that the attacks on PR will lead to articles to be written to call for the decimation of PR. And then you're going to see petitions from horrible conservationists. They're not conservationists. You're going to see then petitions from horrible actors who masquerade as conservationists, but are actually radical preservationists like the CBD, the Center for Biological Diversity, saying that you have to strip fun from states that have predator management in place, although predator management largely falls in line with the North American model of wildlife conservation and also the stipulations of the PR Act. Let me know what you think. Thanks for listening to District of Conservation. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you haven't already, make sure you find us on your preferred podcast player. We largely circulate on Apple, Spotify, and countless others, but those are our two big podcast platforms you want to push make sure you're subscribed there especially on apple if you like the podcast a lot go leave us some reviews we'd be more than grateful to get some five-star reviews from you guys moreover we're on facebook instagram and twitter and a little bit on youtube we don't populate there but connect with us on social media find me personally on social media with blue check marks super easy to find and i would love to hear your feedback and know who you'd like to see on the podcast Thanks for listening to District of Conservation. Stay tuned for the next episode.